said, uh, were to have a large effect on political organization and life generally in China, uh, but both end up uh, would end up collapsing. And in fact, we had left off last time at the uh, uh, the end of the Han Dynasty. Uh, and uh, really, um, there is a, a period after the Han Dynasty was died in which several different smaller regional kingdoms were made bids to try to assert authority throughout China, but they will fail. Uh, in fact, uh, it's not until um, really uh, right around in the north here, uh, this one kingdom in North China, uh, a noble later be known as the Sui Dynasty, that finally will not only make a bid to a certain story, but will actually be successful uh, at once again uh, reforging an uh, empire uh, by war. And uh, this is some, some people would see this uh, as an instance of history repeating itself, because much like we had said the earlier in the earlier uh, session. Uh, that the Qin Dynasty did not last very long, uh, but it really has this very long-lasting effect. Uh, some people will say that the Sui Dynasty, uh, just by the process of bringing together China again, um, it's not going to last forever. It's only going to be a dynasty that is around uh, 30 years in power, uh, but it's going to pave the way for these, uh, especially the Tang Dynasty, uh, the second of the two dynasties we'll talk about today. All three, by the time we end today, uh, we're going to see that China uh, is really going to have a, a pre-modern state exceptional organization uh, to the point where uh, uh, both uh, really economically, politically, agriculturally, uh, this is going to be one of the high watermarks of uh, the uh, civilizations we'll study. And uh, this kind of force it has, kind of power, this kind of uh, money, uh, really are going to cause uh, effects throughout all, uh, all of East Asia. Starting with the Sui Dynasty, um, what we're going to see uh, is that uh, one, this, this is what I mentioned to you, uh, in the north of China, when China is still a divided place, it's still not uh, an empire really for a while, uh, this one man, Sui Wendi, uh, is going to be uh, the person who's going to bring empire back. Uh, and uh, just to give you some idea of how unsettled uh, conditions were. For a while in China, uh, Sui Wendi, uh, he actually is going to initially come to power in his northern kingdom, not because another Chinese, uh, another Chinese person put him into place, but in fact, one of these uh, outsiders, these foreigners who invaded China, uh, had such influence in the north of China that in fact he could pick and choose who he wanted to serve. So in fact, Sui Wendi starts off his career as a servant of a foreign ruler, uh, and then. Uh, only later on, he'll make a switch uh, to end up becoming independent. Um, in fact, it's only really a happy accident uh, that uh, allowed Sui Wendi to take power. Um, this, uh, this foreign ruler, uh, who was so powerful, ends up dying, and his only uh, son is very young. Sui Wendi theoretically was supposed to be watching over this younger son and, and uh, uh, really leaving him in power, but we don't think that's the way it would be. He sees this opportunity to stop and pass it up. And uh, the son in question is only seven years old, so uh, basically he, he, uh, he didn't stand a shot. So when he forces this young son uh, off the throne, uh, very soon he uh, will, uh, will disappear from history entirely, and then so when he claims the throne himself, uh, declares himself the new ruler. Interestingly enough, again, um, showing here that he has some idea about uh, what's going to come later on. So when he immediately starts invoking the mandate of heaven again, this idea that we talked about in ancient China, uh, that it is not human beings who decide the next ruler, it is the heavens themselves. So uh, the mandate of heaven and all its mysterious movements has decided that now uh, Sui Wendi is supposedly the new ruler. And that's what he's running with anyway. In any case, uh, Sui Wendi, we think, uh, had an army that was fairly, uh, uh, a fairly strong army. And um, unlike some of the other regional uh, kingdoms at the time who tried to uh, uh, recreate the empire, he was much more successful now, pushing down to the north uh, and beginning to conquer the rest of China once again and creating a new empire. With, uh, and, and creating, in fact, 
an empire that he would name after himself, this, this new dynasty, the Sui, S-U-I. We think that um, upon coming into power, I have just give you some idea. This is what China looks like. Notice that um, I'm not going to talk a lot about it, but if you, if you keep a careful eye on the map, what China is just keeps pushing. Um, you know, China is not a fixed entity in this time. Um, they keep conquering little by little more and more. Uh, there's a reason China is the largest country in the world. And, uh, this was a long, centuries long process by which new territories get absorbed uh, by war. We think Sway Wen Di upon coming to power, um, Beck felt that he had put a lot of time, energy, and blood uh, into conquest, and he wanted to take advantage of the fruits of his labors. Uh, and so, much like the Qin uh, dynasty, the first of the imperial dynasties, we think that uh, Sui Wen Di felt that uh, if you have an empire, well, you ought to put extremely impressive demands on all your subjects, that they have to pay out uh, for the privilege of having you as emperor. Uh, so he immediately starts to do things, for instance, like uh, uh, he has peasants begin to build new palaces. Um, he builds new granaries to keep his grain. He begins to think very seriously about problems about uh, the defense from outsiders. Uh, he recognized that because of his own career, just how much foreigners could come and infiltrate China. And so he actually begins to uh, force peasants also to rebuild the Great Wall that had fallen down at many points, uh, to try to prevent new barbarians from coming in. We also think he immediately begins to uh, uh, dispatch um, more of military uh, expeditions in part, uh, the sort of western parts that I mentioned to you, he begins to extend. He also begins to uh, uh, fight against Korea again. This is a long uh, a long-scale sort of project of the Chinese fight against Korea again and again. We also think that in addition um, to forcing people to work on all this project for free, uh, he also begins to demand a lot of taxes. Now, uh, one could debate about many of these projects to the degree to which the Soviet entity really needed them. Uh, but there is at least one project that even the critics of this dynasty would admit uh, was their masterstroke. This is something known as the Grand Canal. For those of you playing at home, um, on tests in the past, I've had people start to describe the Grand Canal as being the one in Venice. I really need the one in China here. Uh, so keep your mind on China for the time being. I, I promise I won't even mention the Grand Canal in Venice in this course if I can avoid it. What is the Grand Canal? Um, the Grand Canal ends up becoming, at the time, probably the largest uh, kind of water work project that had ever been accomplished uh, by people. Uh, and uh, its main goal was not like some canals, just to get water to crops. Its main goal was actually to link up different regions of China uh, that previously had uh, really not been very well coordinated together. Uh, things like, for instance, getting Military, trade, communications, um, all of these things. Um, and especially because China has been um, apart for a long time, um, even the roads that they had were not very good. A canal, once built, yeah, the thought was that this would actually manage to tie together the country uh, in a much better way than before. But here I'm showing this map. It gives you some idea of um, where this canal runs. You can see up into the north parts of China. Uh, down into the southern regions, toward the east. Uh, and um, all together, the canal, this is what it looks like today, uh, is going to extend for over 1,200 miles. So it's just to say a lot of digging uh, that peasants have to do at the time. And it's also going to be uh, very long, uh, very wide, wide, I should say. Uh, this is actually another point in the modern one, which is it's a little bit deceptive because it's uh, in the intervening centuries, they've made it even wider. Uh, but initially, the basic goal was you should be able to have two ships, one going up to the north and one going to the south. They should be able to pass by well, one another without uh, without forcing one of them off the canal at any given time. And they, they kept to that. By uh, and uh, we think that um, really the, the Grand Canal was a fantastic project because now. 
Um, different areas of China could specialize in certain crops and reliably know that they could get those crops to elsewhere in China uh, by means of the Grand Canal. Um, and so, and in fact, it actually helps prosperity throughout China. The crops now can circulate much more easily than they had uh, previously. And we think that altogether, uh, this integrates China's economy. So it really was a worthwhile project. Some people would also say, by the way, uh, that um, in terms of, um, you know, we think of Chinese culture as being uh, already unified, but in fact, it really wasn't. Uh, and China had been at war with itself for a long time. Uh, having the Grand Canal allowed people and ideas to really uh, flow much more freely in China, uh, so in addition just to its economic effects. Whatever you think of these construction projects, though, um, the same exact sort of um, thing that we've seen in the past, that the enforcement of this leak hasn't to work this hard for this long, is going to generate a considerable amount of hostility. And that actually happens again. Uh, and in fact, uh, what we begin to see after all these oppressive demands is that a huge revolt begins uh, throughout China. Uh, and in fact, it becomes so general. Uh, that it's actually quite amazing just how quickly this way managed to lose uh, any sort of hold in the country. And, uh, in fact, uh, the final uh, emperor of this dynasty ends up actually being assassinated by one of his own uh, ministers, and that very quickly uh, brings this way to an end. However, those of you who love um, uh, empire will be happy to know uh, that um, the dynastic uh, cycle of repeat itself again. And once again, after a time of war, uh, we're going to see a uh, time of unification. And in fact, uh, it actually was not that long of a gap between the end of the Sui dynasty and the beginnings of this new and much more prosperous dynasty. Please, yeah. So why did that emperor, when he, he was a servant, so why did he treat all his people terribly? When you get into power sometimes, I think you really begin to feel that you're better than other people. I mean, um, you know, he felt he had worked for all this money, he deserved it. Um, it was foolish. Um, if you ever become a dictator, you want to oppress people with not too much, uh, just enough to be able to get everything you want. I mean, with money, but I mean, in essence, I mean, they probably would have lived with fewer demands, but once you ratchet them up to the level, they become totally oppressive, then you get people out of the streets. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it is interesting that, right, you think that some of it started off as like, in a humbler stature would care more about it. Nope. <laughs> um, after the end of the Sui Dynasty, uh, we get into this period in which uh, rebel leaders uh, will seize control of uh, the machinery of government, uh, and we very quickly see the rise of another dynasty. And one really that, in some ways, uh, is far more successful than what he's getting rid of. Uh, this is the Tang Dynasty. The Tang Dynasty is a dynasty that when people think about China in this period, they think a lot about it because it is a dynasty uh, that uh, lasts for around 300 years. It also is a dynasty that was powerful uh, and productive. And a lot of the, um, uh, the success of the dynasty is due to this man named Tang Taizu. Um, who, um, in some ways, sets it off on a uh, a, a good uh, sort of a trajectory. Tang Taizu was ambitious and ruthless, and so, for instance, to uh, to gain the throne initially, he actually uh, uh, murders his two brothers and forces his father to to uh, leave the position, which you would not think would be the makings of a great emperor altogether. As soon as he gets the power, though, I think that uh, Tang Taizu. Uh, seems to really actually have a sense of duty. Um, he really thinks that his job is, is to provide something like a stable and effective government. And so he actually begins very quickly um, building all sorts of cities, including a capital city. He also makes sure to undertake projects that are meant to be popular, that people will like. So for instance, before he came to power, there had been a lot of problems uh, with robberies along the different roads in China. Uh, and the good part about having an empire at your disposal, you send in the army. And he actually begins to systematically go to places where there are robbers and begins to just execute them, uh, which is a very popular project because then uh, 
uh, people can trade much more easily in traffic. Very interestingly, too, um, a content student realizes that if you're going to keep the peasants happy, you have to make sure they're at least well fed. And what he does is he makes the price of rice artificially low. In other words, um, basically they're selling it for less than they should be selling it on purpose to make sure that everyone has enough, money, enough food to eat. And this is true, by the way, of taxation too. We learn from the past. Uh, he realized that if you're going to, uh, if taxes are too high, people are definitely going to revolt. So he, especially on the poor, he keeps taxes at a relatively low rate. He still takes taxes, but not as much as he could. Uh, Altogether, uh, we mean this means that China has unusual stability during this period and prosperity. Here, by the way, in the background, this is just one um, building that comes up the Tang Dynasty. Everything else is modern, but you see one thing. Even after Tang Tai Tsung uh, dies, though, uh, the Tang Dynasty really builds strength upon strength. And many people think that three policies in particular really explain uh, just why they were as good as they were. First of all, we think the Tang Dynasty takes very seriously uh, that the idea that to be able to have China as a unified place, you need to make sure your roads, and now the Grand Canal, is kept up. There's a lot of money put into infrastructure. And in fact, um, in addition to that, we think um, the government begins to create, uh, first of all, a better postal system. Uh, and really something like, um, uh, especially for government communications, there's basically something like the Pony Express comes into being. Um, they have this long line of like um, stations in which uh, government officials can come, ride their horses in, they can get something to eat, they can switch out horses, and then they can just keep on riding with important messages uh, to be delivered. Uh, so especially when it comes to things like military or diplomacy, things that have to be communicated quickly, they actually have a means to do that. Um, supposedly, for instance, um, you could, you could um, get seafood from the, uh, from the ocean all the way to like, the interior part of China within you know, a few days. And heaven knows what it tastes like when it got there. One could theoretically do it now. Um, this system works so well. We also have later, later emperors of the Tang Dynasty will think a lot about um, who gets what land. Uh, and uh, they actually create a new system uh, referred to as the equal field system. Uh, and that the fear in the past had been that uh, some people had managed to concentrate a lot of land. And the idea of the equal field system is to try as much as possible to distribute the land in a way uh, that all families could have what they needed. So what the government does is it goes out, it looks at fields, and decides who gets what based upon individual family needs. Um, and what based upon the fertility of the land. After, um, essentially, the head of the family dies, the head of the family can only pass down a fifth of the, his land to people in his own family. Everything else reverts back to the government, four-fifths of the land. Then the government can come back, can look at that land, decide if, uh, uh, how it's going to redistribute the land. If, you know, uh, if the new family, based upon the eldest son, needs the land to give to them, they can give to other families that have more mouths. So um, uh, the land is always coming back to the government, a large portion of it, uh, so they can decide what to do with it. Finally, the last of these things that was important for the Tang Dynasty was uh, bureaucracy. Right? Choosing officials based <coughs> upon merit. Uh, and uh, I had told you before that uh, there had already been universities in existence in China. But now, uh, in fact, the uh, universities also have this very elaborate examination system that they put in place uh, to decide who gets what good government jobs. And uh, in fact, these, these exams were so devilishly hard that people would spend years upon years of their lives uh, trying to get ready for these exams. Because your score on these exams would actually decide uh, what kind of government position you got. And, uh, um, 
you can, most of you probably think when you're studying for a test, the idea is you just get the gist of something. You get, you know, you get the, the overall idea. But that is not at all what they felt in Imperial China. Uh, and, uh, for these exams, you would not just have to uh, get the idea of text. You would have to memorize uh, line after line after line uh, of some of these uh, ancient Chinese texts. Um, to text like some of the ones, by the way, that you read, for instance, this class, um, Confucius, The Art of War. And uh, to the point where if I just you know, asked you, you know, to do cite like, you know, the first chapter of The Art of War, you'd just be able to rattle it off like that. Um, and uh, that was the way that people were tested in the system. But people just spent years memorizing word after word. Um, and, uh, I know a lot of people say, like, well, <laughs> This sounds like a terrible system <laughs> to test people. I mean, basically, couldn't you, you know, train a monkey to memorize uh, a lot of texts and to just spit them back? Um, the thing is, though, what's interesting about this, um, and the reason why the system doesn't fail is it really forces people who are extremely hard working. I mean, they really have to spend years of their lives to get all these texts in their head. Uh, so at the end of the day, you did have people who were really diligent, willing to apply themselves. Uh, so um, it, it, a lot of people couldn't couldn't really uh, do this kind of work. They wouldn't enter civil service at all. So to some degree, it did actually ensure people who had talent. Altogether, <coughs> uh, we think that none of these policies I just talked about were new to the content, but they applied them very effectively, uh, and um, there's some of the backbone of their success. Of course, one of the, the fun parts, though, of the, of the Imperial Imperial State, though, uh, is not only as they think oh, constantly about um, improvements on the civil sphere, uh, but always about war, too. And uh, in fact, uh, very soon after the Tang, you get uh, Tang Tai Tsung and other uh, emperors of the Tang Dynasty take over, um, they quickly begin to flex China's muscles yet again. Uh, so, for instance, um, you'll notice. Um, see again, <laughs> China just keeps growing. See this western part here. Uh, this did not used to be China. It had to be conquered first, and it was conquered by the Tang in the period. Uh, they also um, will uh, begin to extend into what today is modern day Vietnam as well. Um, but what's actually interesting too is that China recognizes that um, it, it really, it, it, as huge it is, as it is, and big as the military it has. It can't conquer everything. Um, but it, its new ideology of state, is, it, it begins to refer to itself, China, as power as the middle kingdom. And it begins to refer to everything else around it, especially in Asia now at this time, as being a bunch of subordinate kingdoms that have to acknowledge that it is the middle kingdom. It is literally the center of the universe, uh, and they are lesser. So, for instance, Korea, with which um, China is often at war, had to view itself as a subordinate power in its relationships with China. So, how did you prove that? Well, um, all of these surrounding places that China had not yet conquered uh, would have to send diplomats to the Chinese court, the Chinese emperor. They'd have to present him with fine gifts from wherever they came from, and then they would have to um, do a ritual. Uh, called the cow tap, where quite literally they would um, go down and they they touch their forehead down to the floor. I'm not going to do it because I see your face shield on. Um, it's realized, um, and so that was meant to to uh, express the fact that they are subordinate. They were lower uh, than the Chinese. Now, what's interesting about this is this is not an economic uh, sort of loss in these countries because as soon as they do the cow tap, like this sort of uh, this ritual debasement. The emperor then will go ahead and give them much more expensive gifts to take back to their country. But the Chinese emperor, he can afford anything. He doesn't care about this money. Uh, the point is not uh, that the Chinese emperor was taking money from them. The point is that they had to show just how lowly they were before the Chinese, uh, that they were lesser states and lesser people. Please. Um, so, it, so what happened if the other like countries or provinces didn't like, go to China and give them gifts and all that? I mean, there's a real threat, then um, they would be the next ones on the hit list. Um, in fact, they could just use military force against them. Okay. That, this, this ritual didn't necessarily preclude military force, but at least um, it held it off potentially for a while. Um, we think uh, sometimes when these, um, these uh, diplomats came back, too, 
Um, part of the reason for their journey is that uh, the Chinese wanted to teach them more about Chinese culture. Um, and not innocently, they wanted them to take back Chinese culture with them. Uh, so it helped to perpetuate these their own realms. Under certain able rulers, we think uh, the Tang dynasty was able to um, really to flourish. Uh, but as time goes on, as we've seen the old dynasties, uh, we think the Tang dynasty begins to stumble. And it really begins to, uh, we think that um, the, the Tang dynasty rules so well for so long uh, that um, some of the later emperors didn't actually have the talent of the, uh, the earlier Tang emperors. They didn't need to. That they came uh, to power at a time when things were uh, relatively easy. Uh, and what this means is some of the later emperors, I mean, rumors begin to circulate that they spend all their time sort of uh, fooling around with their concubines, they're sleeping around, um, you know, listening to music, playing sports, um, and uh, really, in effect, doing everything but paying attention to the government. Uh, and uh, what we really begin to see is that. Um, there becomes this huge gap between the military and the state uh, as the, the Tang Dynasty goes on. Many generals in the field basically stopped listening to the emperor because he was so, they were so ineffectual. And um, this becomes very dangerous because generals have these outsized power because they have these huge military forces. Uh, and uh, in fact, we see um, some generals beginning uh, to basically look like they're on. Uh, they're an outright rebellion from the government. They're acting independently. Um, the, the Tang Dynasty, um, this is probably the worst way they possibly could have dealt with this problem. Uh, the Tang Dynasty began to lose trust in its own military. And the way that they tried to deal with this is that they bring an outside military, a, uh, a Turkish force from northern China. Uh, they bring it in to try to actually fight against their own Chinese military. Um, this is a terrible, terrible move, uh, and in fact, uh, it actually, what it means is that um, many of their subjects lose faith completely in the government. They're so incompetent, they had to deal with, you know, they bring it outside to try to, to fight against their own army. The other problem, of course, is bringing this outside army is that this army also begins to sack China. Uh, it's not just uh, the Chinese army. In addition, later, uh, Later Tang uh, uh, emperors, because they really uh, were not paying attention to the reins of government, many of their own officials start to become corrupt. They, for instance, will take bribes. And let's say, uh, rather than distribute the land fairly according to the equal field system, any rich family who gave enough money, they would give them more land. And so that system actually begins to uh, misfire. Eventually, we think. Uh, that um, uh, many of the, the generals uh, that uh, on the Tang state so go completely out of control uh, that the only hope in the end is the Tang dynasty begins to allow regional military forces to try to fight against it to check the, of, of the authority of the army. And uh, what basically ends up happening as a result of this is any sort of pretense that there's a centralized government falls away completely. Uh, on the local level, people are now seized power. What we begin to see for a certain period uh, is these local military commanders become warlords, and they start to seize power on the local level. Uh, in fact, we'll see a period uh, in which um, really there's really sustained civil war again. Finally, out of the dust of this situation, uh, we'll see uh, once again a dynasty that will rise up. Uh, and managed to reimpose centralized authority. And this is the, the last of the three dynasties we'll talk about today, the Su dynasty. This, the, the term looks like Song. Uh, and, uh, what's, what's so interesting about the Su dynasty is that uh, it learns, they learn from the past, but in a way that actually makes them really much less effective in the long run. Uh, the Su dynasty actually um, is a state that is bit not very powerful in the least bit, in part because there's this systematic distrust of the military. Because in fact, they saw what had happened during the Tang Dynasty. There's a memory of that, uh, that the Tang Dynasty had collapsed as a result of an overpowerful military. 
And uh, the result of this is that, in fact, the Sioux state is eventually going to be destroyed by outside militaries because they didn't have enough military to fight uh, against the invaders. So, uh, in fact, uh, one of those times where uh, you have to be careful what you wish for. Um, the first uh, emperor of this dynasty is pictured here. It's the Sioux Tai Tzu, uh, who really, in some ways, um, sets the standard for the emperors of this, this dynasty. So, uh, this is someone uh, who starts off as being a junior officer for one of these small-time uh, warlords in China before uh, imperial authority was reimposed, uh, and actually the northern region of China. Uh, but we do think that Sun Tai Tzu gets this reputation among his own uh, forces being someone who's honest, who's effective, who's well-liked. And eventually, he's actually, um, he'll get promoted. His own soldiers decide that um, they are willing to fight for him. And Sun Tai Tzu decides to, again, go through this process that the other emperors have uh, of actually conquering China again, pushing to the south and getting rid of all of the independent warlords and then putting himself in power. And after that, uh, he clearly uh, begins to um, organize uh, the state, this new state he's conquered. And I told you, one of the, uh, the, the sort of quirks of the Sung dynasty is that um, Sung Tai Tzu himself was a military man. He really had served in the military, he conquered with the military. But as soon as he takes China, he begins to uh, really sap the power of the military systematically. He does not want a strong military because he's afraid. Uh, that they'll eventually wreck the government. So he actually pulls the plug on a lot of the military's funding, which is uh, unusual for a uh, Chinese dynasty. So what does he put money into? Well, um, there are many things that Sun puts in uh, money into. First of all, um, he, there's always this, this uh, fear that not only will the military uh, potentially wreck the Chinese state, the Sun were also afraid that um, what happens if their own officials should try to revolt against them? And the result, they really pay their own uh, their own officials, their civil servants, very well in China. Uh, they work all, all, all money over in the hopes that if they're well paid, they won't want to work against the government. Uh, this sounds like a good move, by the way, uh, but um, we think that. Uh, Almost all the ex ex surplus money of the government goes towards government officials. They overpay uh, their own men to a certain degree. The other thing that is very interesting about the Sioux, we haven't, you know, we'll probably get too far into this, uh, the nature of the force, but um, for those people who do study art uh, in China, uh, this actually is a fantastic period because rather than um, give money to the army, um, in fact, a lot of the, uh, the Sioux money actually is funneled into culture. They'll pay for all sorts of, uh, uh, they don't pay, uh, painting becomes a major art in this period. Um, calligraphy, the art of writing beautifully, uh, actually uh, in China takes off with government funding during this time period. Uh, here's a, a soon scholar, so engrossed in a scholar in his studies doesn't recognize that his own clothing is just slipping off the floor. Um, uh, again, uh, weaving because the major art of this time period. A hair in spring. You get the idea, basically. Um, uh, all of all of these products uh, come from really uh, uh, again. There's this sort of large amount of production on the art sphere, um, which uh, again, for those who do study that, um, it's a really lucky thing we have. Out of it. Please. Um, how come all the emperors are depicted as very large men? That's true, they are. Um, uh, in part, I mean, um, uh, it, it's not necessarily a, a, a bad thing uh, for them to be so. I mean, uh, it's one of the ways you can project the fact that um, you're prosperous. Is that uh, it, So, um, as opposed to some like Western art that will go out of where to sort of hide uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the largeness of its rulers sometimes, because it's seen as a bad thing. Um, being obese is not necessarily seen as a bad thing because it means you're, you're prosperous and you're, you're, um, you have a lot. So, um, so you have more money for food mm -hmm. and so they think you're just rich. Exactly. Okay. So it's, it's not necessarily seen as a, as, a, as a negative thing, but you're absolutely right that there's no hesitation. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Yeah. You're maybe actually exaggerating. 
Now, um, it's okay, those of you who like art, this is a great period. Um, for those who like the war, though, I'm sorry to say that uh, China runs into a, a bit of a darker period. Uh, and, uh, and part of this is because, uh, again, this mismanagement of the army. Uh, the Sun Dynasty, the attitude is that not only are we not going to give money to the army, a lot of it, but the people who put in charge of the army are people who have gone through the same exact examination system. Uh, these are people who will be the generals. People who, in many cases, had never seen action, were all of a sudden required to take control of large armies. And they read about in books. Um, but, but imagine all of you having read the art of war, and now I give you, you know, a, a contingent of soldiers to go out and conquer something. You probably wouldn't do a great job. Maybe some of you would, but a lot of them did not do. Uh, and in fact, um, what we begin to see is that when the military runs into real challenges, um, neither the leaders nor the amount of men they have in the field could actually respond to them. Uh, and uh, what we actually see here is that. Um, all sorts of nomadic uh, leaders now begin to pour over Chinese borders in recognition of the fact that the military uh, cannot hold them back. And uh, in fact, they're going to suffer a lot of defeats from nomadic forces, uh, the last of which we'll discuss uh, next time on Wednesday uh, when the Mongols come and basically wipe out this dynasty off the planet. Uh, but even before that point, they were ready on the defensive because their military was weak. Lest I end on a negative point, though, at nearly every class, um, it is fair to say that um, taken together, these two last dynasties, the Tang and the Sun, uh, some people would say uh, that this is an area of a time period of really an economic surge in China altogether. Um, that even despite all these problems that eventually politically would handicap China, economically speaking, I mean, there's a real reason why all these nomadic night groups begin to attack China. Not because they just like the landscape. China has a lot of money during this period. And uh, this economic development takes place on several different fronts simultaneously. Um, first of these uh, is the, the always exciting agricultural side. Um, the Chinese during this time period will discover a, a form of fast ripening rice. Uh, and um, this rice actually allowed them in one planting season to put in two series of crops, which means that there's a lot more food. Uh, and uh, as, again, as all of you know, the more food you have, the more people you can sustain. So the Chinese population begins to go up significantly. And, uh, it's really, we see that, uh, I had already told you in the last session, the Chinese already now for a long time have had very good iron tools. And now they begin to invest even more money. Uh, for instance, coming up with um, these very heavy iron plows that can cut through uh, very easily a lot of soil in China. Uh, they begin to increasingly use more and more oxen and water buffalo and breed them to be able to do uh, the work of plowing much better than using humans. The Chinese really by this time here too have become experts at irrigation systems getting water to crops, running off too much water, all of these things. Um, Altogether, what this means for China uh, is that, as I mentioned earlier, first of all, number of people goes up. And really, what we also see is that um, urban life, something that uh, has never been entirely lacking for China, but um, urban life now really becomes uh, a, a common thing for many people in China. And these cities of really enormous size begin to balloon. Um, so for instance, uh, in the Tang Dynasty, the capital city, you don't have to know this, this course, but the city of Shang'an uh, will have as many as 2 million residents. Or again, for a pre-modern city, that's, that's a huge city, really. Um, and, uh, in cities like Shang'an, I mean, you begin to see like this whole kind of urban life beginning to grow up. I mean, all the things you may think of uh, next to the city, you know, restaurants, bars, um, places for entertainment, you know, theaters, markets, huge markets, all of these things begin to, to blossom. Um, and, uh, none of this means, by the way, I should say that um, everyone begins to run to a city all of a sudden. I mean, the vast majority of people live on the land. But uh, city life is becoming uh, a much more significant part of Chinese life, and it really drives a certain portions of the economy. Uh, so, for instance, um, 
uh, the more uh, people produce, as I mentioned, um, you begin to see more and more products uh, that are uh, really come out of one specific region, uh, specialized products that can be then transported. Again, because as I mentioned earlier, a lot of these governments are smart enough to invest in communications, roads, canals, to take these things. Uh, so really, um, the idea of being a merchant is very common now in China. Uh, they're all over the place. China also, um, the market benefits of having a rising population, having just more Chinese around, uh, is that uh, again, you only need so many people working on the farm to be able to produce your food. Uh, and so, uh, in fact, it, the fact that they have more people to work on the land and they have these sort of labor saving techniques really allows them to free up more and more people to do other tasks. Uh, and uh, this is why we see technological and industrial development. Uh, so, for instance, uh, this is the time period uh, in which China actually uh, begins to become one of the world leaders in porcelain. Uh, porcelain, which is uh, used both within China. Uh, and then gradually it will come to international export as well. I hear friends say porcelain balls. Another thing that, um, I mean, this is nothing, um, uh, this is nothing entirely, it's just that China becomes much better at it. Um, you work in metal. Uh, this is just one schematic here to give you some idea uh, of uh, the kind of complicated process that the Chinese would use uh, to be able to. Uh, uh, the cast metal. This becomes a very common thing throughout China. Uh, and so, for instance, um, iron and steel uh, are simply worked much better in much larger quantities than ever before. Uh, and that these are affected as tools. We also begin to see in China, again, the same sort of industrial push simultaneously, we begin to see new products begin uh, to, uh, uh, to rise up. Uh, one of them is one that, of course, become quite popular in later centuries, uh, which is gunpowder. And uh, it's actually uh, always a little frustrating for people who study China to wonder, uh, you know, why did gunpowder become deadlier uh, in China? Uh, the Chinese do discover gunpowder. Uh, it's in their initial uh, uses, it really was little more than firecrackers, more or less, is what they could do uh, with gunpowder at this point. It had really low grade. Uh, but once the idea of gunpowder exists, it can be refined, and it is right, in later generations. And in fact, it's refined even better outside of China. Uh, but you initially had to discover it to start out. Uh, another invention this time period, the printing press. Um, really, it's centuries before it'll actually make its way uh, into Western Europe, the Chinese already had the printing press. As the Chinese develop this, though, they run into a certain problem. In the Chinese language, there are a huge number of different characters. Uh, and so um, what we usually refer to in the West is something known as, as movable type. Uh, so if you've ever seen sort of like one of those old sort of um, uh, get-ups from an old, um, uh, an old newspaper, uh, what they'll do is they'll have individual letters, and they'll put them into the cast. Uh, and then um, they'll put uh, they'll put um, the... Um, uh, they'll, they'll put the, uh, the ink on them, they'll press them down. Uh, and you can do that uh, with the English language because there are only so many letters. You can just put the letters in and out. Uh, the great problem the Chinese run into is that would never have worked in China at this time because the huge number of different uh, uh, characters would really make it much more difficult. And so they actually developed this form of printing initially known as woodblock printing. And, uh, it, it really is uh, exactly as you may think. Um, with woodblock printing, what the Chinese do is they take a block of wood, they'll carve it in reverse. Uh, so eventually they can press it down. And um, they'll put ink on it, and then they'll, they'll, uh, they'll, they'll put paper underneath it and press it on. And what they do is with woodblock printing, um, you can actually very easily carve both all of the different characters that you needed. Uh, and as you can see here, um, any sort of like simple pictures. Uh, that you wanted to go with uh, your image as well. This is the Buddha. Uh, so why is this important? Uh, well, for the first time really ever in human history, the Chinese now had developed uh, an ability to disseminate the written word, and with images, of course, if you wanted them, 
much faster, much more efficiently, much more cheaply than ever before. Uh, and so you could now have huge quantities of a text that you wanted to own. So we think about like those poor students, for instance, who are studying for their exam, the examination system. Um, they actually uh, could have a copy of these texts. Even uh, people who are uh, not necessarily the highest class, you actually own a copy. And that's a huge difference now. Um, so what it means that altogether in China, you see a lot more printing, a lot more of the preserved written word. And this takes forever to manage to make it out of China. Uh, but once it exists, of course, uh, the idea can, uh, can go further. We also see the Chinese uh, developing for the first time a compass. Uh, and uh, you may wonder, you know, well, who cares about a compass? Um, again, the idea of a compass uh, is extremely, what a compass is, it tells you what direction you're heading in. Um, and that, the reason why this is important is if you're sailing by sea, if you just stay directly close to um, um, to the shore, you can tell where you're going by the large. If, however, you go out into the open sea, where there is no uh, easy landmark to see, it's virtually impossible to be able to, to navigate. Imagine if there's a storm or something. Uh, with a compass, however, you can actually tell what direction you're going into at any given point. Uh, so, uh, in fact, this is going to prove to be a very handy thing later on for any sort of maritime or trade. Altogether, we think. Oh, here's this uh, Chinese ship. Altogether, we think um, that um, the Chinese were producing uh, a lot of this stuff for just domestic consumption, but it doesn't stop there. Uh, in fact, uh, many of these uh, these merchants, again, as we mentioned earlier, this is not a totally new idea. Silk Road was already in existence, but more and more uh, Chinese are beginning to turn to go to international markets. Uh, and uh, in addition to some of those old sort of staples like uh, silk, which have always was attractive to outsiders, and continue to be so. Now they can actually bring some of these new uh, items, like this porcelain in large numbers, and they can take that with them as well uh, and go to, to uh, other markets. Uh, and uh, in effect, um, to give you just some measure of how, uh, at least on a domestic sphere, um, just how uh, much trading, which the volume of trading in China goes up during this period. Um, there's not enough coins produced in China to be able to handle the amount of trade. And, uh, this is actually so the first time ever you begin to see a government experimenting now with paper money. Uh, and, uh, paper money, I should say, uh, is, again, you may think that again, this is an obvious thing from the, you grew up with it. <laughs> Your children won't grow up with it. Uh, but um, you all know uh, the, the benefit of paper money. Um, the thing is, paper money is a real risk because it implies that you have enough faith in the government uh, to be able to uh, to maintain it. Uh, and uh, the good thing about um, coins, uh, coins of this period, is that they were used with, used with a precious uh, material. Uh, but once uh, you know, like you know, gold or silver, so you can melt it down. And the government goes under. Paper money is not the same. Uh, so it implies that the Chinese government is stable enough to be able to print money that everyone will want to take. Uh, and that's true. One of the other uh, things that the Chinese put into effect during this period is not just paper money, but also the first experiments in counterfeit uh, also come up practically simultaneous uh, with the beginning of paper money. The upshot of all of this on the economic front is that a result of urbanization trade, and uh, just the amount of money, China becomes a very cosmopolitan society. And it's not just now Chinese merchants going out to it. China becomes this hub. So, you know, people who want to make money, outsiders like this guy here, um, they all begin to make their way to big Chinese markets. And some of these big port cities in China uh, just become lots of trade from the outside. Uh, and in fact, um, China, in many cases, actually, the Chinese now didn't have to worry about their own merchants bringing back some of those great items from elsewhere, spices, pearls, horses. Those things came with foreign merchants. They just would come and bring them to China and trade them themselves. Uh, and so uh, this is actually when we see, uh, and many of those merchants, of course, then would in turn uh, take Chinese goods and then go back to their own countries. And so um, it actually was not an unusual thing in some of uh, the richer uh, civilizations to see uh, Chinese goods all over the place. Yeah. What that means uh, on the whole is that 
Uh, during the Tang uh, and Sun dynasties, you see this enrichment and refinement of Chinese civilization. Uh, and uh, some people would actually consider this to be one of the golden ages in all of Chinese history. Uh, even if its spread is basically confined to the, the, uh, uh, the East Asia. And so, in fact, uh, we know from many of the, the foreign travelers who have come to China during this period, they were absolutely amazed at the level of sophistication, the level of money uh, that was in China at this time. Uh, in fact, they were just all on its wonders. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we will continue that on Wednesday. Thank you.